experiences of my life. Um, the first thing is St. Richard's prayer. Uh, St. Richard said, day by day, dear Lord, of thee three things I pray, to see thee more clearly, love thee more dearly, follow thee more nearly, day by day. The second thing that I think about every day is a song that comes from Leonard Bernstein's Mass. And that was a show that I was in when I was about 11 years old. And I opened the Kennedy Center. And that song goes like this. It is the, almost the opening of the show. It says, um, sing God a simple song. Make it up as you go along, loud out loud day. For God is the simplest of all. And it just repeats that. For God is the simplest of all. I will sing the Lord a new song to praise him, to bless him, to bless the Lord. I will sing his praises while I live all of my days. For the Lord is my shade. He is the shade upon my right hand. And the sun shall not smite me by day nor the moon by night. Blessed is the man who loves the Lord. Lauda, lauda, laude. Now, Family is very important to me. And I was raised with a, my mom has about nine brothers and sisters. They all average about three children each. We all went to the same little school called St. Richard's School. And every day we would all gather and go to church, at first, it was a very small chapel because there were only 50 people in the school. By the time I was in sixth grade, we had moved into the church because there were now about 250. Every day, we sang St. Richard's Prayer, the day by day that I told you about. And so that repetition just got in to my head. You knew you were going to say it, and it, from kindergarten through sixth grade, that repetition, you walked out into the world, and you thought about those things. Day by day, dear Lord, of these three things I pray, to see thee more clearly, love thee more dearly, follow thee more nearly, day by day. Every Friday night, my, well, one of those aunts would come by St. Richard's School. And it was her duty to pick up all the children. We must have looked like the Beverly Hillbillies because, you know, it was all in one car. And as I said, there had to be 12 to 15 kids in this car sitting on laps. Of course, you know, laws were different back then. Seatbelts, ah, forget that. And we would go to that aunt's house who picked us up. Now, every mother who came by the school after that would be told, oh, they've already been picked up. And it wasn't any panic situation. From that point on, every aunt would drive to every sister's house until they found out where the family was. And that's where the Friday night party was. Friday nights, that aunt who had picked us up would make huge bowls of chili or maybe oxtails. Uh, maybe it was salmon salad. It was something that you could put together and feed a lot of people. And we would listen to family stories. Well, let me just say that most of the children would be someplace playing. And I, the inquisitive one, the nosy one, the Miss Kravitz, would sit in a corner and listen to all these people tell all these lot, tell all their stories. 
And I really got a history of not only what my family had been through, I got a real history of black folks in this country. I was a choir boy, Episcopal choir boy. And that was very important to me too. I was one of the best choir boys in the country. And I know that, I say that because up in Lenox, Massachusetts, there was a place, well, Tanglewood, and every summer there was an auxiliary organization that would um, sponsor 50 boys from around the country, boy, boy, choir boys, and we would go up into the Berkshire Hills, Maybe it was a place called, places called Cranwell Resort right now, but it used to be called Cranwell School. There was also Lenox Country Day School, Stockbridge Country Day School. We would gather, Amherst College, we would gather at these places and for eight weeks, we would concertize. 50 boys going crazy in the Berkshire Hills singing at Tanglewood about once, maybe twice a week. We all love Seiji Ozawa and couldn't understand why so many of the people in the orchestra had nothing good to say about him. It was a wonderful, wonderful summer. I did this for four summers in a row. And in the third summer, Leonard Bernstein came. He was writing a piece called Mass. It was going to open the Kennedy Center, and he wanted about 14 boys to be in this production. I was selected, and from, I think, July, end of July, maybe beginning of August, to almost November, I toured that show. It opened Washington, D.C.'s Kennedy Center, and the building was not completed at all yet. And so every night, I, being so small, I could crawl into the ventilation system and snake my way to all the different dressing rooms, and I would just watch everybody through the vents. I mean, it wasn't just me being a... a What's that called now, a uh, uh, stalker? Yeah, no, it wasn't just me. It was about six or seven of the little boys just going all throughout the Kennedy Center. I was exposed to things at a very early age that I probably shouldn't have been. But every night, from the wings or maybe the catwalks of that theater, I would always sit in the darkness and wait for that song to come on, the strum of a guitar, and all of a sudden that, sing God a simple song, loud a loud day, make it up as you go along, loud a loud day, sing like you like to sing. God loves all the simple things. For God is the simplest of all. For God is the simplest of all. Every night I used to listen to that, and it made such sense to me. I went home that summer and I talked to my dad. There were some things going on in Indianapolis, some political strife. We had a senator who was a Luger. Uh, uh, he was actually the mayor of Indianapolis, and he was annexing the five surrounding counties, and he would totally dilute the black vote. Now, 12, 13 years old, I didn't quite know what this meant, but that actually gave my dad license to really start talking to me 
about not only our family history, but the history of what black folks had been going through in America. Black folks land in the United States in 1619. Maybe I'll get to tell you a little story. I know one of the descendants who's also a drum, drum instructor um, and his family were, was one of the first families that enslaved one of these uh, 20 Africans that came to America. Now that's not the way he would put it. Being politically correct, he told me, we took them in. But again, that's another story. We discuss the history of what happened to us in this country. It seems to me that almost, this is why this is a, such an exciting time. It is not, hope is not, hope is the word we live in, in this state, right? This is the hope state. Hope is not active enough. So I live in a state of expectation. Excuse me a minute, my, okay. I've got a little dog under my table. He has a very curly tail and he's just intercepted all my cords with that tail. Okay, he's calm now. So in thinking about this speech today or this talk today, I was thinking about the things that I've encountered in my life, the history that I know, because that talk with my father was the thing that really propelled me into my quest about religions and a quest about making sense of this history. I'm, I, I, I've been trying to remember this exact quote but Mark Twain said, history doesn't repeat itself, but does anybody know this quote? But it, it basically, it mirrors itself. Do you know, do you know that quote? I heard a chime. Okay, well, he said, basically he says that it just kind of, uh, history mirrors itself enough that it seems like it repeats itself. And as I look at, at history, it's very, very funny. Let me just throw out some dates that I've been thinking about, just early history. Um, 1641, you know, Massachusetts rec recognizes the legitimacy of slavery, right? We, 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 we talk in, as we're teaching kids that, um, um, that the South is really responsible for the enslavement of African Americans. And what we really fail to teach a lot of times is that the money backing power was all coming out of New England. Um, ah, here's some other things. Um, uh, 1648, the governor of Virginia decides that they're going to start producing rice. Well, rice became a real big staple in Virginia and South Carolina. South Carolina at this time that has double the amount of African Americans in the state than whites. Well, why? Because they couldn't, white folks couldn't take the the climate, the heat, the, the extreme humidity. So many of the plantation owners would live in North Carolina and even Virginia. They have these grand estates down in the South that were, they were labor mills basically. Um, um, uh, 1663, black and white indentured servants and free people are living together in Virginia in uh, integrated communities. But about two years later, <laughs> that is all wiped out. 
Now, I, I'm, I know I'm rambling. I hope you guys can get this, but I am the, going back to the rice thing. So Virginia starts to really produce a lot of rice. Uh, rice becomes a, an incredible commodity. Well, what does rice do? You're laboring out in the hot, hot fields. You have to labor and plant rice in water. The hot sun coming down, reflected by the water, literally cooks you, making people sterile. All of these things just become amazing to me. Fast forward in history. Uh, my grandfather serves in World War I. Um, he was one of the people who um, said that my service will bring about the equality that we, uh, that we deserve and will prove my loyalty to uh, the United States. This was a large belief. And as soon as they come back, multiple riots across the country. People in, African Americans in uniform are killed all over the country. Black laws enacted because now they have military training. People think that they're gonna come back to the United States and use their military training to demand freedom. My uncle in World War II, one of my mother's Husband, one of my mother's sister's husbands was one of the Tuskegee Airmen. He, in fact, was in the first class of Tuskegee Airmen. Third in command to Benjamin Oliver Davis. He finishes his military service, comes back to Indianapolis, Indiana, steps off the bus and looks at the bus station. And it says, no Negroes allowed. Here's a man who'd served his country and he's not allowed in the bus station. Bobby Kennedy gives a speech in 1968 in Indianapolis, Indiana. Me and my dad are there, me on my dad's shoulders. And Indianapolis is the only town that doesn't riot. Now, everybody talks about the, the speech that Kennedy gave. And if you had heard it, it really wasn't about anything. But what I understood was empathy. And because he had had the experience of having his brother killed, everybody in the crowd understood that experience. Because Indianapolis was a knockheads city. That night, Indianapolis did not erupt. I knew at that point that what we have to, we have to give people the ability. We have to allow people the ability to be, to have empathy. And that is the only way we are going to understand this. We are taught a history in our public schools that would have you believe that that history is the common experience of people in this country. Every school child learns about the Oregon Trail. Am I correct? Nobody talks about if black folks went down the Oregon Trail, a couple of years into that, that emigration, 
they enacted black laws. So actually black people had to diverge and either go south to California. Hopefully it was right around then, maybe 1850, so they could go to the gold fields. Many of them went north to Washington State. Washington State, of course, that territory had been more British, so there was more freedom and more empathy for black folks up there. And those black folks that got to the gold country, well, when they tried to file their claim, they were allowed to file a claim, but every month they had an extra $3 tax put on their claim. And the minute they couldn't pay that $3 tax, somebody would claim their claim. Give and take, giving and taking away, giving and taking away. And this experience, people talk about 400 years. This is 500 years of this experience. African-American history has a lot of names that that common American history has no idea of. How many people here know, just nod heads, um, uh, Elauda Equiano, anybody know that name? Denmark Vesey. Okay, David Walker. All of those names really are people, explorers, people who actually paved the way for Americans to go to different places. So here it is 101 right now, and I think uh, I've way over talked to myself. So would you guys like to ask questions? I, again, I know I told you, I've had six cups of coffee, so all this rambling, please ask questions because I am notorious for rambling and maybe you can help us all bring it back together. Well, thank you, Rochelle. Maybe we just give a round of applause to start. Okay, um, so yeah, so, and just as, as far as Zoom, Zoom wise, maybe, um, two options. You could, a, you could put a question into the chat box and we can sort of so kind of like compile different questions and then also you can just unmute yourself and ask a question. But I ask with 30 people in the room if we all just like move slow and, and just have space for listening and quiet. And thank you, Rochelle. Thanks for the message and around empathy and what, what you said. So uh, enter your questions in the chat and just jump in if you have a question. Could you share your beautiful voice? <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, you guys, that's so kind. Thank you very much. Can I, can I share it? Uh, sure. But um, let's get some, some questions. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm far really more interested in what you guys are thinking. Um, when I take a shower, you know, this COVID has really messed up all of my... Uh, uh, habits, daily habits. So I was just laughing yesterday. You know, I, I, I take a shower every day, but I took a bath for the first time in months and just <laughs> what an experience, right? Oh my God. Okay. Uh, Lee, Lee, it looks like you have a, Lee, do you want to ask your question actually? And you wrote it in the chat, but maybe you could expand it a little bit. Uh, well, as you were talking, it really um, hit me when you said that, you know, we all live in hope state, but I do not, uh, hope state isn't enough for me. I live in expectation state, and um, I, I kind of, of course, construct the answers in myself, but I would like to hear from you if you can expand up, upon that one a little bit. Uh, living in expectation. Um, I, first of all, I... I take that St. Richard's prayer and use it to try 
to not be so judgmental. Now, this is an exercise for me because I am a Scorpio with six planets in Scorpio. I can come like that to a decision about somebody, you know, judging a book by its cover. And I really, really have to exercise, uh, you know, uh, I have to exercise, I have to really force myself not to do that. So that requires that I intensively listen and look, and I look for opportunities to say, oh, that would be me. All those things that we usually consider faults in other people, you recognize them because you recognize them in yourself. And I have to have that that bounce back. Uh, so I wake up every day, I say those two things, I walk out and I look for ways to be a better person. Um, I had a great experience with my dad. My dad has, uh, you know, that breathing, uh, COPD. Uh, so two or three years ago, uh, I took him out to Martha's Vineyard and we had, which, you know, probably the last time we'll be able to travel together. Uh, I was putting him back on the ferry and we were talking, talking, talking. And out of the corner of my eye, I saw these two older ladies getting on the ferry and they couldn't get those, uh, you know, um, they had suitcases that they don't allow on planes anymore, except through international travel, you know? So they were trying to get it up over the hump and I'm talking to my father, but I'm seeing the struggle out of the corner of my eye. And real quickly, I just said, hold on, dad. Went over, helped these ladies, you know, up over the step, actually took them onto the ferry, got them in place, came back out. And my dad, now, my dad and mom were divorced when I was about five years old. And my dad looked at me with this, you know, what could only be described as admiration and love. And he just looked at me and he said, somebody raised you well. It wasn't him, <laughs> but that was one of the proudest moments for me of my life. Well, in recent history I can, that I can remember. Looking for that opportunity to help people. And that, that's expectation. Um, just, just looking. We're seeing riots outside right now. We are in the middle of this pandemic. Birds are singing louder. Greenhouse gases have gone down by 17%. Isn't it fun? I don't know. I, if you guys could see my dog, I have to walk this pup, pup, 80 pounds worth of pup, twice a day, and we are now doing three miles a day. I, frankly, am sick of walking, but um, got to be done. This city is a much, much more fun place to walk around. Except I do have to bring up, is there an ordinance that if you're drinking out of a glass bottle, you must throw it on the ground and shatter it? That's the only thing that I have to say about walking around Providence. That's my new question. I am so sorry, but I but, must and, leave. And Rochelle, I can, I can sort of moderate the chat. I, there's, a, there's a bunch of, there's a couple themes of questions, and maybe two okay. of them are, um, and actually, quick note as we're doing this Zoom-wise, John Walker, if you could just make me host for a minute, I want to try something with a breakout room. Um, but there's, there's sort of one thread of questions from a few people around, like, what, what can people do, um, you know? Someone chatted me privately. Um, is everyone here doing something to move racial progress forward in Rhode Island? Um, Susan's question, many white and other uh, non-black Americans would like to know what are some things we can do to help affect real change? Um, Nadia's question about um, how do we make sure that em empathy spreads through our country? 
Um, not asking you to answer all those, but I think that's a, a theme that maybe you could speak to next. Okay. Yeah. Quick, really quickly, how, um, how many black folks do you all know? <laughs> nice. Hard, hard to do it on Zoom, but maybe you could put it in the chat if people want to know. Or if you ask a question, people could chat it too. Yeah. And, you know, so that's, that's always one thing that, 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 you know, I always, what can you do? How many black folks do you really know? Um, talk with them. Um, don't, don't ask. Use your own humanity and ask questions. But again, if you say, as I'm saying this, you really, I said, how many black folks do you know? I'm not talking about acquaintances that, you know, I know Jamie Sue who's sitting across me from me at the office. How many do you really know? Because, you know, the intimacy is what is going to allow you to ask the questions that you really need to ask. If you don't know those people, chances are the questions that you're really sincere about are just going to come off really bad. So ingratiate. Make a friend. You know, uh, I find it really funny because I do this all the time. Pick somebody. They seem interesting. Make them your friend. Um, the other question was, what can people do? I think everybody, I think this is really interesting because when you look at out at this crowd right now, you're seeing an integrated group of people. That's, talk about living in expectation. <laughs> That's what we want, right? If it's just black folks out there, you know, demonstrating, it's easier to think about them as the other. Lyndon Johnson looked out from the White House and he saw all the young folks, you know, and they all looked like hippies with peace signs and long hair. And he wondered, who the hell are these people? Because the young folks that were around him all had collared shirts, button down shirts and narrow ties. He didn't know who these people were. But even though he was this Texas born man, and I work in Texas all the time, Dallas, he had the strength to go beyond himself. And that's what we gotta do. You might get squelched when you ask your question. It's just the chance you have to take. Okay, so you ask the wrong person. <laughs> Pick somebody else. Go ahead. Michelle, you know what, I have, I have a thought. And, I, oh, actually, Sylvia, you're raising your, do you wanna jump in? Yes, yeah, so, so Rochelle, that is so poignant that you're, um, what you shared and asking the question is very important and having the relationship to ask the question is even more important. I love, love your presentation today. Unfortunately, I need to jump off and go to another meeting that I have set, but I am just so honored to have you present here and to share your unique perspective. Well, your perspective that is unique in a situation that's common. Um, and I, I, I have no other words to say beyond thank you for this. And as far uh, as the doing, you are right on with it. Just sharing, 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 asking, asking, asking. And uh, Stephen Covey, one of my favorite people, always shares, begin with the, begin with the end in mind, start with understanding. And um, that's where we all can grow. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Bye, Sylvia. everyone. Bye, Sylvia. <clears throat> so one thought I had, Rochelle, with, with 30 people in the room, I, I thought we could just experiment with something for a moment. And there's an easy way on Zoom um, to create 
breakout rooms so people can actually have a moment to dialogue with somebody else and then we can all come back. So I thought we could try that and it's gonna be quick. It's gonna be six minutes, let's say. And in a moment, uh, everyone's gonna get an invitation and you'll then go into a room with two or three other people. And I, I think based on the conversation, maybe a prompt is what's a reflection for you from this conversation and, and give everyone the opportunity to talk for a moment, connect with somebody else, as it's sometimes hard to connect with a big group in Zoom, and then we can all come back. How does that sound? Sounds great. Sounds great, okay. So everyone got an invitation uh, on their way. It's gonna be, you'll be with a group of two or three people. Um, and the prompt again is, What's a reflection for you from this conversation or others you're having on this topic? And then we'll, we'll come back in in about five minutes and uh, ask any other final questions and wrap up. Okay, invitation on the way. And you guys, I, I, I know that I've rambled up. I hope that you have gathered something from this. Uh, usually I, you know, I have somebody that can keep me on straight and narrow. Joining this. Yeah, everyone at the radio room. This is awesome. Okay. Sorry, I was on my group. What happened? Hi, Ed, Edilberta. Oh, okay. I think it's great. Thanks. You have to talk about this stuff. I mean, he rambled, but you can't, in this situation, the last thing you want to do is like interrupt.
Alex. Hey, Manny. Oh, this is a small main session now. I know, it's going to start filling up quick. Look out. <laughs> <laughs> Here everyone comes. Hi. Uh, me. <laughs> hey, Carrie. Hey there, blockhead. <laughs> were you about to say something, Manny? Before I. <laughs> uh, no, no. You could. We, were, we were talking about. You know, you have these things that happen every every so often, and nothing changes. So it keeps happening. <laughs> right. It, it's oh, wow. okay. Bye, Rochelle. So, hey, see you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now everyone uh, is back, I think, and uh, maybe okay. a little more connected. So. I was thinking just with the time and, and respecting time and everything for everyone, it's 120. Um, and and maybe just open the floor and, and to question or comment from your reflection. Um, and Rochelle, jump in on, on anything. You know, you direct a question to Rochelle, or if you want to comment or share, share a reflection, why don't we take 10 minutes and then we'll sort of close it out at 1.30. Um, and if people want to stay, they're welcome to stay, but we'll formally close at 1.30. Joe. I wanted to say one thing to Susan that I didn't get to say in the breakout room, but I'm sure I speak for a lot of the people who were on the screen. Thank you for all your work with the students who presented their poems of self-definition. It was really oh. a joyous occasion. It's the best thing that's happened in the past two weeks. And that's I'm exactly glad the, the students are here to hear that because it was more about them, certainly, than it was about me. And it was, yeah. Because Precisely, but somebody has to somebody has to get the ball rolling, so to speak, and believe in the endeavor. And I just wanted to say how much it meant to everybody I've talked to, who was there. Thank you very much. Delphina and Paulian, and who else from the classes? Well, I think we know. We I've been trying to tell them. Yeah, it was very brave of them to come up. Um, I would like to say to Rochelle that I, I'm just so grateful for you to be here today. It gives us, um, we're going to be discussing your, your talk in my, I, I, I'm an instructor here, um, advanced conversation. So I th I've written, I've been taking notes as you spoke and we're going to, I'm going to use that as next Tuesday's class, the basis for my class next Tuesday. Oh, nice. Uh, wow. We will, we will definitely, um, I wrote down a lot of your vocabulary just because I think it's vocabulary that, that I, I might have to explain, but I think they got the basic message. I know they did. Um, and I think- Susan, could you put a quick context on the class? Like, or, and maybe someone from the class could speak too, just so Rochelle and maybe others, I don't know if everyone knows about what the class is at International House, just 30 seconds. So it's, it's, it's advanced conversation, which means everyone in the class speaks English well enough to understand, even a fast talker like me. Um, and, they're, and they are, um, they come from all over the world, as, as you know, they're, stu they're here in Providence for different reasons. In, in every class is a little bit different. There are several of us that instruct conversation classes. I tend to bring a lot of poetry, um, music, music uh, arts, the arts into the class. And, and as a result, the class ended up writing their own poetry. And if, if um, next time, maybe we'll invite you too. We had an event here on Zoom where everybody, these are, these are students who never even wrote a poem in their own language and didn't think they could do it. They all wrote great poems in the end. We learned that revision is part of poetry, that we all have creativity, all of those things inside of us. And they presented it to a group just like you had today. Um, and they were all brave enough to stand up and read their poem. Um, and it was a wonderful event. And that's what Joe, Joe was talking about. Uh, so that's just one of the things, that, the type of thing that we do uh, at International House. And the theme, nice. of, our, the theme of our poems was, um, who am I? Who am I anyway? And we took that theme from a Brazilian poem that has that as the first line, who am I anyway? It's a poem we had read in class. Uh, one of our Brazilian students read it for us in Portuguese and in English. And then that sort of set off the idea like, gee, we could write a poem with that theme. Anybody can write a poem with that theme. So we did. Oh. Susan, was last week videotaped or Alex, was that, is that taped? Yeah, so, we do have yeah. a recording. Speak and to maybe... Michelle, you could watch it if you wanted to. It's all taped and recorded. And pa Pollyanne or Delphina, if you want to say anything, Floor is yours, and then Jewel has a question after that. So, Pollyanna Delfina, do you want to say something about our class from a student perspective? Any class, all the classes. 
I think you resumed very well the experience of doing poems for the first time and in English, another language that you we don't uh, know much about yet. <laughs> it was a, a very good experience. Like, I think I, I can talk for all of us the students. And that's well, coming from a literature major. <laughs> oh, and isn't, you know, poetry is so revealing, isn't it? I mean, we really you talk about empathy and just pouring your heart out. Yes. Um, I've got a poem real quickly. My father plants the garden bed and I beside his bending form plants dark earth piles around each stem, imagining the sleeping fruit within my father's lap. Of things he sings that could have been coming from rings of neck he wears like years, like dreams that he grabs too hard with gloved hands. And I beside his bending form root in the soul of a weathered man. Hmm. Oh, wow. Oh, you, wow. Did you write that? Bravo. Who wrote that poem? Did you write that poem? Yes. Oh. Wow. Can you, hey, hey, would you send it to um, Alex in writing so that in my class next Tuesday, we, it's hard for people who um, have English as a second language to understand, um, out, you know, when you're speaking. Got it. Yeah. And Got that would be, that would be, we could read it in class that way. And, That'd be great. Um, they, they would love that because now they've met you. Don't you think? Because we're we're writing. We're getting ready to run out of time real quick. Oh. Jewel, Jewel's been waiting with a question. So Jewel, you want to jump in? Oh, yes. Thank you. Hello, guys. Um, I was just wondering, because you talk about empathy, and I encounter kind of the same things when um, regarding Native American history, which is a parallelly like silenced across um, or within the US nation state narrative and they have a similar focus on oral tradition and storytelling um, you know, and interpersonal connecting connections for empathy. And I was wondering if you could maybe recommend to us a story that or something, you know, that people can read because for many of us that are right, you know, because we live in this pampered system is, is, is very hard to um, understand systemic racism if you're not exposed to it, you know, so I would be great if you say like, oh, this is one of my favorite storybooks or this is one of my favorite um, autobiographies that kind of embodies the struggle that we go through well, on a daily basis. Yes. You know, um, honestly, I would, for what group, for, for you, something yeah. that you, if I mean, like, if you say empathy, it should be good for anybody, right? Because it's like an interpersonal experience that the, the fear, we share the same fear of, you know, being repressed or neglected by society. So I guess probably there is something that could work for everyone, right? Well, okay. Um, my, my grandmother was um, uh, Choctaw. And that is a tradition um, uh, of people that I am very well acquainted with um, and is, while I call myself a Christian, I generally refer to God as the great mystery. So Native American uh, traditional uh, thought is something that I'm very well acquainted with and I think is one of the things that I think about. There is a wonderful story um, it is about Bra Rabbit, um, and now in my neighborhood, he's called Bra Rabbit, but uh, he is really, in the native peoples, he's just simply called Rabbit. Um, rabbit goes to a community meeting, and you know, Rabbit, oh my God, he always talking, always talking, always talking, and so they want to have, the animals want to have this community meeting, but you know, they don't want Rabbit to come. Now that's the way the story starts out. I am working on this story and I have added a song to it. Um, and eventually I'll put it on video and you can hear it then. Um, but that you can go and just look at rabbit stories, whether they be African American or Native American. And it generally is 
about empathy of some kind or the rejection of empathy because we also learn the opposite way. You know, learning is a two street thing. You know, there's that mom love where she keeps on saying, honey, don't touch the stove, don't touch the stove, don't touch the stove. And then there's the dad love where he goes, honey, don't touch the stove, honey, don't touch the stove. Touch the stove. See, I told you. Dad experience, mom experience. Learning is two ways. Thank and, you. And I'm just going to, it, it just in continued interest that there's something for me about time that it kind of is honoring. So I just want to say it's 1.30. I know some people need to go. Um, I don't know, Rochelle, if you're, if, what your time is like, whether you're able to stay. And I think the room on the International House side, we'll keep the room open. There are a few other questions in the chat. So, but I, I do want to give people the, if people need to go, <laughs> leave without feeling like, oh, I'm going to leave in the middle. I can't quite leave now. So, you know, the, we'll formally kind of call it, uh, call it, uh, uh, have a marker point there. And just one, two quick announcements. Um, you know, and one, two, two thoughts about supporting this work. You know, the International House, um, we'd like after this week to be able to do, start a fund. We, we can actually get specific donations to support and pay artists and um, storytellers and people to come in and, and we can really build something robust so we can actually go ahead and, and do that. So if anyone wants to um, take an action on the financial side today, um, you could donate to International House. If you designate it specifically for um, this event or for this event in the future, we'll designate the money so we can invite Rhode Island Black storytellers, um, artists like Rochelle, Rochelle himself to come back and, and do a program and, and we can support that financially. So if, you're, if you want to take that action, it's, um, you can go to our website and go ahead and donate. And I also want to put in Connor Walker, Connor, I think, was in the meeting earlier, Rochelle. Um, I think he's a colleague of yours, but he also said, he texted me to announce they can also send, a, if you want to take a financial action, uh, Black Lives Matter, Rhode Island, and stagesoffreedom.org um, are two other organizations, along with Rhode Island Black Storytellers, um, that if you want to take an action financially and you're able to, that opportunity is, is there. Um, so I will, uh, with that, just really round of applause for Rochelle and, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, okay. and maybe people can go or stay and Rochelle, are you able to stay a few minutes if people have questions or do you have to roll? Yeah, the caffeine has dwindled now. I'm, I'm, I'm probably normal. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So if people want to hang out, it's an open room, just it's zoom. So it can get weird if it's too unstructured, but I will step out of the way and I'm still here, but people feel free to ask other questions and go if you need to go and stay if you, if you can and want to stay. Alex, I have a question. Oh. Alex, I have a question. Were you gonna be able to mention the clothing drive yeah, too? Sorry, Nadia. Yeah, one more. Yeah, you know what, you know what Nadia, I'll, I'll put it in the newsletter. That's I feel okay. like too much at once, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll, We'll change the dates, yeah. Um, 10 seconds, there's, there, Nadia is working, uh, there's a doctor who's taking collections for homeless COVID patients, and they've created a whole facility and, and they're, they need uh, clothing donations. We're, we'll send something out next week on how to do that and I'll more formally yeah. announce it. Um, okay, thank thanks. You. Sorry, I missed that. That's great, Nadia, thank you for doing this. Yeah, if you have any clothing or shoes or anything that for adult men and women, um, there's a there's a great need for that. Well, my dog has, my dog is a puppy, and my dog has been chewing up all my shoes. So I think what I'll do oh. is grab <laughs> grab what's left, and I'd rather it go to someone who needs it. My dog has plenty of toys. Oh, oh, can can I just quickly jump in? So because I know a lot of students have been moving, but all the donation centers are still closed. Like the Salvation Army um, is not opening until. Oh. Or they just opened now. So, but there's a lot of things that is still out there on the streets from students. 
So, I mean, I'm not sure if that helps, but you can, Naya, maybe you can pass it on because um, it's just on the street and it's normally passed out like in a Facebook group that I'm on. It's called like where people search for house housing and they normally when they move out, they have this all, all the stuff that they have to get rid of. But since the donation centers have been closed, it's just up out on the street for grabs. So and it's like really good stuff you know like expensive furniture and whatnot. good to know i've seen people driving around uh east side of Prov when i'm walking the dog i see people driving around the east side of providence because they know that right now people are this is the time when a lot of people are moving a lot of students and there's so much stuff up for grabs out on the street if, if i didn't have the dog with me i'd probably grab a few things i mean they're putting out good stuff <laughs> some of these students come from money and they, their <laughs> parents bought them very good stuff for um you know to have in their in their apartments uh so yeah if there was a way to get some of the, you know i don't know to grab yeah them. with the donations I definitely for... have some food. yeah i have some food donations from the flat where i lived previously and then my chinese housemates moved out they couldn't take their food but I don't eat that much spicy food I was like oh no spontaneous human combustion <laughs> not happening yeah, to I, me <laughs> I think for this for this initiative what we're really asking for is um clean clothes that are that are still wearable they don't need repairs they're not ripped they're not torn things that you would wear but maybe you're just tired of them or whatever um and they need to be clean and Alex I wrote a blurb that Alex was going to put on the website about that um, we're working with a woman named Crystal who's organizing the whole initiative. She's the head case manager at this um, hospital for homeless COVID po positive men and women. And she's been very clear about um, not wanting junk, um, you know, stuff. It has to be clothing, shoes in, in good shape that she can then just give, make sure it gets distributed. But that's good to know. Um, can, I, can I just say, Rochelle, I, I got real lucky, everybody. I was in a chat room with Rochelle. Oh, I was and, wondering. <laughs> yeah, and um, we, we um, I think, Rochelle, can you, you know, what I, we didn't have time, we ran out of time, but what I've been reading about, because um, I've been reading a lot about racism lately, and I've been reading about that shift in language from saying, I'm not a racist, I'm not racist, to I'm anti-racist. Can you speak to that? Because that, to me, is an important shift. Well, uh, then maybe you should speak to it because I really don't, I don't know anything about it. And I, uh, <laughs> I just, I don't know anything about it. I tell you, you know, I spend so much time in airports that, um, I, I'm in Dallas an awful lot. And uh, until this COVID, you know, hit and, uh, I, I wait for those <laughs> I don't know, I've got a problem. I wait for those big white guys with Make America Great Again hats. And I sit next to them and mm -hmm. I wait, and, you know, yep. how are you, sir? You know, just like that. And eventually I'll kind of, you know, meld into conversation and ask them, you know, what what is that about? And I do this constantly. I don't make statement, and even though they might say stuff that I could take issue with, I don't know them well enough, right? So I'm just trying to ask questions to understand how they've arrived at this place. Mm -hmm. And if I can try to get to that Point, well, then maybe I can um, develop an argument, but you, you know, or a rebuttal. But you can't, you can't engage until people are willing to engage. And it is, you know, what did Martin Luther King say about character, right? So you have to engage uh, with character. And I don't mean, uh, oh God, I'm, I'm lost in thought. Let me, let me just say this real quick though. You know, Biden, Biden said this thing. Did, did everybody see the, the clip where Biden was talking to uh, Charlemagne <laughs> the God? Yeah. yeah. Okay. 
Well, no, 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 no. Uh huh. Wait. You don't think so? We need to understand that, right? And when I asked everybody, um, how many black folks did they know? Biden has actually spent a lot of time around black folks and he has black advisors. Now, I don't know if you guys are familiar with a concept called code switching. Are you? No. Oh, okay, so black folks, um, are raised if you had if, if <laughs> now take everything that I say with a grain of salt. Um, black folks generally, if you are upwardly mobile, if you are moving through different classes of people, we are taught to code switch from a very oh. early age. I have to speak to my hi. brother. Hi. How are you? I, I have to speak to my brothers in one way, and I have to speak to, um, I was a member of an Episcopal church downtown, very proper, and I had to know how to, neg how to navigate both of those worlds. Code switching is the term that is used nowadays. But from the time that I was a little boy, I called it chameleoning. You assume the clothing of the environment that you're around. And so, you know, that's what you have to do. So when I, I mean, I, I bring that up because Biden has been around black folks and what he did was go into his code switching mode where he was talking to a brother. The mistake that he made was he wasn't familiar with the brother. So had they been on a more intimate term, I think that Charlemagne would have probably laughed and asked another question, but Biden was trying to be too familiar with a guy that he wasn't familiar with. To me, it spoke a little bit of the weakness of arrogance in that moment, and, and there's a tendency, he had same, similar uh, engagements with um, Kamala Harris in the debate where it was like, there was a defensiveness to it, which, look, in my opinion, I mean, if you're on the stage all day, like you're gonna make mistakes. So it's a mistake, you move on. And and the guy is a got a heart and empathy, and like you're saying, he knows black people. But that to me, that was the error is arrogance. For that was my experience of it. Interesting to hear you describe it too. Like the 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 in, the proximity really brings it back to what you mentioned earlier about how many black people do you know? And you reminded me of Brian Stevenson talking about proximity. Because all of that work is around when you, you're intimate and you have proximity, it's a, and, and that's a perfect example. It's good to hear you explain it that way with he didn't know Charlemagne the God. Maybe if he knew him for an, a couple hours more, the same statement lands differently. Yeah. yeah, well, you know, one thing we would never see, um, we would never see Orange Julius say that, right? We would never see that because who's orange? I, I don't know who's orange. Julius. <laughs> I think we know who orange is. <laughs> oh, orange Julius. Oh, got it. Orange Julius. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, um, I I refuse to say the p word because you know um, it, it, it's just amazing to me that uh, yeah, yeah, I travel in Europe and people in Europe just sit and you know when they finally get to know you and they feel comfortable enough with you, they'll go, how, how did you elect this? You know, he was, at, he was at Pearl Harbor and didn't really know the historical significance of it. Hey, Paul, Paul Yen, you had a que you put a question in the chat about that. Do you want to say? Do you want to? Oh, yeah, I uh, yes, I made a question to Rochelle. It's a uh, whole. Just a minute. I will 
read this question to not permit a... Oh, yes. How a faraway government and all its represent can retard the conquest of equality in terms of uh, the end of racial discrimination and other kind of inequality in US society? Um, I'm, do, you, I'm, you, do you understand? This? Yeah, I'm not sure that I get the essence. Um, okay. A, a far right government, how it can uh, delay the, conquer, the conquest of uh, rights uh, in the civil rights and uh, feminist movement, uh, racial movement. Yeah. Kind of. Do you think uh, that that is just that this is a problem with just far right governments? I think you know. Again, if we look historically. It's, it is a government out of touch. Um, again, I, I go back in history and I, you know, I, I, I've, I've read Marcus Aurelius and I am really making a lot of parallels to this time and the fall of the Roman Empire. It is when when the government is out of touch with its people. And, you know, to this gentleman- To uh, themselves, yeah, not to the people. Yeah, yeah. So I don't think it just has to be a far right government, you know, at all. Uh, I think that this, this is happening. You know, we've reached this point in the world where this is, we have the largest herd Ever. There are billions of people on this planet. Normally, when herds get this big, there is something that culls it. Um, so, I mean, I'm not just trying to throw out negative. I, I really, I think about all of these things and I, you know, I watch, I was raised on eight acres of woods and I used to find the peace of the woods and watching the animals just, that was my thing. I would come home from school, I would run into the woods, I would hear the triangle of my mother ring and I knew it was dinner time. But I had been out in the woods for three hours, you know, two to three hours. And I just really think that this is such a grand opportunity for us to really rethink the entire world. Um, not going back to what was normal. So we have a chance. Everybody has to vote, right? I mean, everybody has to vote. And it's on younger people more than anybody. Old folks turn out to vote. The only thing that's going to keep older folks from not voting is, you know, if Orange Julius doesn't allow us to have mail-in votes. Well, I don't know. I, personally, I also, I think that there's way too much, uh, I'll put this out just so you all understand where I come from. I think, I think we're dealing with a sociopath. So all the expectations, you know, of why isn't he doing this or why doesn't he have empathy? I, I think you accept that he's a sociopath. Okay. I don't know if I answered your question. I'm, I hope, I hope, I hope I scared.